Hey everybody, thanks for joining me with Border City Rock Talk, where you get some great interviews with great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Today I've got Andy Curran and we're talking about the new Envy of None album, which sounds like garbage. Garbage in a great way, Shirley Manson, <laughs> the lead singer. How are you doing, Andy? The way I was about to throw down the gloves going, wait a second, sounds like garbage? No, I'm I'm, uh, I'm doing really well, Ernest. How are you? But they, And good to be back on the show, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I got the lighting fixed. So um, in relation to the garbage, just so everybody knows, it's, I'm telling you guys, it's an effing great album. I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, I was listening to it for the last couple of days. And um, just to get into, um, actually, I got... To, I got to, kind of thrown, raked over the coals. I did an interview with Greta Van Fleet a few years ago, and my whole interview was based on, this song sounds like this band, this song, and a lot of people was like, quit, quit saying they copy. I'm not saying they copy. Everybody's got an influence, right? Yeah, yeah. Like you've got 5,000 blues singers in Louisiana. They don't copy each other. It's a style, right? So yeah. with this album, Shirley Manson and Garbage definitely comes to mind. Depeche Mode, 1,000%. The Big Cure. Term. Yep. Um, yeah. I hear in it um, all elements of what you and Alex and Alfio and, I, well, Maya, she, she's young. She hasn't grown up with these people, but uh, yeah. even uh, bands like uh, the Pumpkins and stuff, there's just so much into it. Yeah. Wow. I, like, I don't, I don't know what to say. I, the people on April 8th, it's being released, correct? Correct. A full album out April 8th. And and thank you for the kind words, buddy. And and oh. uh, listen, it's not the first time um, somebody has uh, made a garbage reference with Shirley Manson. And, and uh, I love that band from the day they came out. I remember, I, I you know, off air, we, we spoke about um, I'm Only Happy When It Rains and Stupid Girl. And I bought the records. And I, I listen, there's some above and beyond, I guess, stylistically with because there was some industrial electronic component to what Garbage was doing, which I yeah. think, and there there is a component of that with Envy of None. But then when you put a female vocal on top of that, yeah. and and you get that real juxtaposition. So um, with Butch Vig and his production chops, you're essentially, there's an interesting analogy there, because I believe that Butch and the other members of, of Garbage were older than Shirley, yeah. which we are much older than Maya. Mm -hmm. Um, drawing from Butch's production chops, Alf Annabellini is a producer, mixer by trade, but plays guitar, keyboards, and he and I have been working together for a very long time and had been talking about um, Ernest, but we were writing music and putting it away for a rainy day, and a lot of it was electronic, and a lot of it was vibey yeah. and had loops, and it had a bits of industrial feels like the song Liar has been kicking around for quite some time. I actually... Mm -hmm. wrote that originally um, and got in touch with Dave Ogilvy when he had his band Jackalope and he was looking for songs and so I sent Liar or just bits and pieces of Liar and said you like this he said I think it sounds fantastic but the, our lead vocalist has just left the band and Jackalope is no more so I just put that back into my my catalog and, and really wanted to finish Liar off but um, mm -hmm. with Maya's uh, vocal chops you know, and what, and, and and just the interesting harmonies that she's creating. Yes. Um, I can see why you would make the garbage reference. And Alf and I are guilty for sure of wearing some of our influences on our sleeve in this record. Whether it's a song like "Never Said I Love You" or "Dumb," the two of us are big Depeche Mode fans. We oh, wow. love a lot of alternative '80s and '90s music and, and electronic stuff. And you know, as most of the people who know me know me as a knucklehead rock guy. That's what I am. I love, I grew up on, on, you know, Aerosmith and Cheap Trick and Thin Lizzy and James Gang and Joe Walsh and The Rush. And, and so there's a big hard rock element to yeah. what people know me for. Right. But but the, take that away, Ernest, and this oh. fan side of me yeah. lo loves all of the artists that you just spoke about. Love them. Love Depeche Mode, went to see them. Um, I love their use of keyboards and just the atmospheric. So it was an itch that I wanted to scratch. And the more I spoke with Alex Lifeson, the more I found out that he also was a fan of electronic and ambient music and experimental. And so the, the blinders kind of opened for yeah. Alex, Alex and I. When you said to me, it's not, I didn't know what to expect because I think a smooth. 
where's the guitar solos or people will be that doesn't sound like no tattoos but that that was purposely done as as musicians we have a lot of fun stepping outside our box and just it was liberating to try this this different avenue and and, and putting Maya's vocal on it man which is like yeah. a cherry a cherry on the top before you said no tattoos you said something in the video froze can you go back do you remember exactly what you said um I think you know I probably said people probably know know me for, as a yeah, hard rock metal, not, not the hard rock stuff yeah, yeah. And um it, 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 and and I said, you know, this, I could hear people going, well, this isn't Rush. This, yeah, yeah. This is, where's the guitar solo? Okay, where's here Alex Lyson's yeah. guitar this, solo? This yeah. isn't no tattoos. Where's the, mm -hmm. where's the four in the floor? I yeah. have to, I have to just get my dog. She's barking. Yeah. I think she's lonely. I'll be right this back. Is, I'll this introduce is what you. what makes these interviews great. Yeah, this I'm is I'm going to introduce you to Margaret. She's a 94 pound Bernese mountain dog and she's sad right now. One second. Okay. <laughs> okay, bye. Margaret. <laughs> it's the second time I had an interview and somebody walked away on me. Last week, uh, Derek Sagan walked away to get a picture of Richard Pryor. Oh, okay, there we go. Margaret. Okay, see, she's she's a she suffers sometimes from a little bit of uh, there she is there. There's Margaret. Hey, Margaret. I, don't know, I don't know if you can see her. Yeah, she's yeah. not ninety four pounds of love, but if you ignore her for too long, yeah, like like most other women, she doesn't get it. She's not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> It's funny you say that because I'm a kind. I love dogs, but I'm a cat person. But that's the opposite of cats. Male cats are the ones that are sucky. Oh, is it? I didn't know. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm more of a dog guy. We did. I did have a few cats growing up, but she's. Uh, listen, she's. It's. It's amazing to have her around. But sometimes in the middle of interviews, she gets yeah. a little bit, a bit needy. Sorry about that, but no, don't be sorry. That's what makes them unique. And um, you know, I don't like to have these blase interviews where you like so. Who's your favorite band? You know what I mean? Like you know, <laughs> the standard Q&A uh, monotone. So with the Dep Depeche Mode thing, I got to tell you, man, a little story I have. I backpacked across Mexico. I love that country. I flew into Mexico City one year. Okay. And then um, after a couple of weeks, I fled to Acapulco. Well, I didn't fled. I, I, I went to Acapulco and back. Okay. And I went into a, a nightclub when I was, uh, I had two more weeks in Mexico City. It was in a bar. It was called Segundo Piso. Second floor, if you know it's Spanish. And I got to tell you, I liked a bit of The Cure growing up. And I was always like you. I was into my Maiden, my Aussie, Randy Rhodes style kind of music. Sure, yeah. But they had a Depeche Mode cover band. And I left Mexico just listening to nothing but Depeche Mode. I mean, I can't believe I missed it on my radar, probably because I was in my egocentric hard rock stage. Sure. But um, yeah, I mean, the that cure, comes across in the The Cure album. is another big one for Alf I and I. The cure. Um, you know, you, you definitely, I would say some of the keyboard, a lot of the keyboard flavorings and anything that like never said, I love you or dumb, oh, love those, song. those two songs in particular, I think we drew from our influences from specifically Alf and myself. Maya's too young to know those. Yeah. We actually, we actually said, Hey, go back and listen to the cars Go back and listen to Depeche Mode. Go back and listen to The Cure. We yeah. were trying. We're trying to get her to realize where some of the inspiration came from. She's her own girl. She's got a, such a great um, command of, of melody and lyrics and everything. Yeah. So she didn't need much prodding. But um, good on you for hearing those. And guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> no, no guilt at all. Um, yeah, that's actually to be honest with you. If I had to pick a favorite song. Um, did you do all the mixing and producing for most of it? Um, well, for producing, let, let's start with producing because this record was made in such an odd way. Uh, nothing like what I've ever done before in terms of normally your traditional conventional way is having a producer. One guy comes in and he's sort of like your mentor. He's the hockey coach. He's the, yep. the general manager, right? No. We, did, we didn't do it that way. Uh, a seed of an idea. And let's take Never Said I Love You. Yeah. Seed of Never, Never Said I Love You came from yours truly. I sent it over to Alf, said, I think, I think this is pretty cool. He laid his stuff on it. No producers in any of the room. I'm producing my stuff when I'm happy with it. It leaves the nest. I send it over to Alf. 
the same thing happened with Alf. He would do his own thing instinctually. It would go over to Alex, same thing. And then Maya puts her stuff on top. Or a lot of times Alex would say, I want Maya to, I want to hear Maya's vocal before I do my guitar parts. So yeah. in terms of production, if any, if, when the record comes out and you look at it, it'll say produced by Andy of none because all four of us produced okay. it. Um, and it was very liberating to work that way. And any musicians that are listening to this, you're used to having that interaction, Ernest, where somebody would say, hey, Andy, that's great that you played an A. Why don't you try a G over this? Or And, and there was none of that. So it was all very intimate in, and nothing left my, my studio until I was happy with it. And same with right. everybody else. In terms of mixing, um, just giving my feedback after the fact, Alf and Alex mixed the, a lot. some of the songs that Alex was um, a key component in, like Kabul Blues and Spy House and Western Sunset. He mixed yeah. those tracks. Uh, for the most part, Alf mixed the other ones. But there was, I think maybe we, even with Look Inside, there might have been a sort of collaborative mix effort between uh, Alex and Alf. But those two guys mainly handled most of the mixing. The reason I asked was because having that track at the first at the beginning 30 seconds in I was hooked I mean um first thing I thought like I, I know of Maya I've interviewed her before and listened to her some of her stuff um it came smooth I thought wow what a smooth voice that's what I, I thought of um and it's kind of funny you're speaking she's a little bit younger um, people are definitely going to get to know uh, more of her with this uh, project with Envy of None, but uh, I kind of joked with her. I said, I know that you and Andy and um, and uh, Alex didn't meet, meet bumping into each other at a bar clubbing <laughs> one night. <laughs> no, we did not. <laughs> so, yeah, she's she's such a great talent and it's, um, it's just interesting. So uh, the three songs you mentioned that you said Alex um, kind of um, uh, produced – um, or mix it. No, you said produce, I think. Um, yeah, yeah I can tell produce, yep. because yep. I wasn't hearing many guitar parts per se standing out in the first five or six songs. And then, like you said, Spy House and uh, Western Sunset. Spy House starts off with kind of a Jimi Hendrix kind of a wah wah kind of thing. Sure. Yep. And then, in, even in the guitar solo, I don't know if you noticed, but I kind of felt it had kind of a Carlos Santana meets Joe Satriani in the solo. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, before I talk to you about Alex's track, you mentioned something about um, Maya's voice being smooth. Yeah. And um, as a fellow vocalist, you know, uh, like an athlete, you have different gears, you know, you're, yeah. you're either sprinting or you're doing a marathon. And um, so for me, um, the way I always approach vocals, especially in the latter part of my career, um, doing my Leisure World Records or Drug Plan or Caramel, um, I'd have different gears. Some some of them I'd be singing up close and quiet and other ones I'd be screaming my ass off, right? But with Maya, there was a few songs where she said, I think I, I, I need to redo the vocal. I need to sing more forceful. And, I, and, and our feedback to her was no. The juxtaposition of a song like Enemy with some heavy guitars yeah. and your and your smooth vocal approach mm -hmm. is what makes this so unique. Don't feel compelled that you have to raunch your voice out. Just be yeah. you. So so we encourage her to stay in that vocal register and and in her comfort zone. But I just wanted to bring it up because I yeah. agree with you. It, her voice is so silky smooth. Yeah. And um, we tried to keep her there because that, that's where I think she's really comfortable. But in terms of Alex um, and his guitar parts, if he was on with us right now, mm -hmm. he would tell you that he intentionally wrote the guitar parts for all of those other songs that are not obvious. In, 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 it was intentionally done that to process them, to turn them backwards, to make them sound like they weren't a guitar. So oftentimes I would call and say, dude, I don't know what you did, but it sounded amazing. What did, I, it, where did you play guitar? And he said, Andy, there's guitars all the way through it. Perfect example, if you listen to um, Look Inside, which just dropped on Spotify and Apple and Amazon uh, yesterday. Okay. It, there's a pulsating rhythmic thing off the top. And yeah. it's just like, a dit, 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 dit. And, and it's hard to put your finger on what it is. It's actually Alex Lifeson playing guitar. 
Um, there's so many windy, trippy things that are soundscapey. And Alex really had his head in this soundscapey thing where he wanted to approach the guitar less conventional. But when you get to Spy House and Kabul, then you go, oh yeah, there's the there's my guy yeah. from Rush. There's my guy from Rush. There's some guitar solos. Uh, I'm, I, and I'm not talking out of school uh, out of school here, but I did. There was many occasions that both Maya and I said to him, "Would you blast a guitar solo at the end of this song? We we feel it needs like Dog's Life is a perfect example. Al on the outro of Dog's Life, why don't you rip it? Just rip it. Go for it, dude. Give me some. Give me give me limelight. And he was like, nope, not feeling it not feeling it. I'm, and next thing you know, we get some kind of a rhythmic pulsating, mm -hmm. you know, offbeat reggae syncopated thing. Yeah. There's a lot, it was a lot about rhythms with him. So, you know, for Rush fans that are listening, I, I don't know if they're going to appreciate the fact that Alex put on a white lab coat and was a mad scientist with his guitar parts as yeah. opposed to as opposed to them going, well, I where's where's Tom Sawyer? Where's Limelight? Where's this? Because they're not going to get it on this record. They might get a piece of it yeah. in Kabul and Spy House. Um, but it was intentional. And it was something that he really enjoyed the ride uh, doing. He wanted to carve some new territory. And soundscaping is the best word, two words that I can give you to describe his tones on this record. Yeah. And the, the unique thing is, you're right, there are some spots in there where I was... I listen for a few seconds, like I'm listening to the song and then I'm okay. That's the guitar part. Like you don't get it right away, but it's just him playing a note and turning up his volume on his guitar, turning it down. Like, yep. you know what I mean? Yep. So yeah. yeah. It, and speaking of which Western sunset kind of threw me for a loop, not, and it was the last song on the track and I'm waiting. Okay. When's Maya coming in? When's Maya coming in? When's Maya coming in? And is that the particular song that was written for Neil? It was. I and had I can, a feeling. I knew. It yeah, was. it was. And I can, I, I, I can, I can address your when's Maya coming in and when's because what happened was, Ernest, when we got about three quarters the way finished this record, we had a conversation with Alex because uh, anybody that's familiar with Alex um, might recall that Spy House and Kabul were used in the launch of the Gibson Epiphone video. So there, yeah. were, there, were, there was instrumental versions of those tracks out there. Right. And so we had a conversation, Alf, Maya, and myself with Alex going, how do you feel about maybe making these Envy of None? Let's let Maya sing on them. Uh, and he was like, oh, wow, that'd be awesome. Let's give it a shot. And, and I know if uh, when you eventually talk to Maya, she'll tell you that that might have been one of the biggest challenges that she faced was trying to put some lyrics on those two songs that were essentially finished and, and out there. Um, and, and I think she did a great job. And Alex adjusted the mix. So for any fans that might go, this is a ripoff. I've already heard Spy House and Kabul. These are two, they're, they're very different songs now with Maya yeah. Wynn singing on them. Mm -hmm. When it came time to Western Sunset, nobody in Envy of None knew that the song had been inspired and written while Alex had one of his last visits with his buddy, Neil Peart. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when he asked me if I would play bass on, on that track, um, there was no mention of where, what the inspiration was. I'm glad he didn't tell me, Ernest, because I think I, I would have got really choked up because Neil was also a friend of mine, nowhere near as close to as, as uh, Getty and Alex were. Yeah. But ironically, I played fretless bass on that track and the bass that I played was given to me from Getty, uh, Getty Lee. It was a Jaco Pistorius relic fretless bass. So all of a sudden, you know, in my mind, as a Rush fan, okay, I played a bass that Getty gave me on a track that was written, inspired by Neil, by Alex, right? Yeah. So um, come full circle on this uh, story that I'm telling you about Western Sunset, Maya did try. She tried singing some, some vocals oh. on it. Um, she tried some sort of oohs and ahs and pads and everything. And then I think at the end of it, Alex and Maya had a conversation and they both agreed that the song spoke better as an instrumental yeah and the last thing i'll tell you is the instrumental part of it 
after you've digested the full Envy of None record, at the end, Alex was like, let's put it at the end because it's almost like a bit of a breather. <laughs> you know, you've been, you've been, ha you've been hammered with this, like these dense tracks and, and you've taken on this ride from liar to enemy to dumb to look inside to, you know, Kabul and Spy House. So Alex on a production end said, wouldn't it be nice to end the record with this peaceful, tranquil, uh, tranquil, yeah, you know, a little bit of an ear break, but just a nice instrumental vibe. So that was the reason that we put it at the end of the record. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anywhere else on the album there was acoustic guitar, was there? You can, well, actually, you know, not prominent. Okay. Certainly not prominent. Um, there's acoustic, and and I uh, Alex and I just did an interview with the German uh, uh, music uh, instrument magazine, and he said, yeah, here's where I played acoustic. So all through the chorus of um, Never Said I Love You, in the breakdown of Liar, um, there's some other rhythmic places where Alex played some acoustic, but it, okay. but it, but it wouldn't be in your face where you go that's acoustic it's more like a shimmering layer of it okay um and it's a sonic thing um you know when you get to the chorus of never said i love you and it lifts and it smacks you in the head you're kind of going wow that really worked part of that was because yeah. alex had layered okay some acoustic guitars you know for some rhythmic stuff coming in there too right so very subtle use of acoustic in the record okay uh, this is great i didn't know you spoke german so we get this there <laughs> All I know is Auf Wiedersehen and um, Bratwurst and uh, Heineken, uh, you know, anyway, um, I've been to Germany a bunch of times. I love it. I was there for, uh, I remember waking up in my hotel room I that Rush was on tour and we were in Mannheim and um, I walked out on a Sunday morning at 11 o'clock and all of a sudden, I just the, this this big giant square that was empty the night before was filled with Germans smoking, drinking, eating, and it was eleven in the morning, and I was like, "Oh, breakfast, awesome. yeah." And but there was beer everywhere and bratwurst and people smoking. Every, everybody was smoking, right? And I loved it, Ernest. It was good. Was it October? Uh, it was. Okay, it was so October. There festival yeah. thing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of when you were saying, I woke up in my hotel room, it brought me back to that story you told me during our previous interview where I had the solar flare on my forehead. Yeah. Um, tell us the story about when you were in Sault Ste. Marie and how you, uh, you woke up and you don't know how you got to the States and back. Okay. Do we have to do an explicit warning? Uh, no. Nope. Uh, disclaimer. Okay. So this is a true story. We um, can swear on here. Derek again okay. just the other day said, can I fucking swear in your podcast? I said, yeah. <laughs> so um, you'll, you're going to have to remind me of the famous Sault Ste. Marie Rock Club. Eastgate Hotel. Eastgate. So we played the Eastgate. The band is, uh, is the early reincarnations of what I call the no tattoos band. Um, so I had uh, a, a couple of young guys, Ray Buck and Harry Smith, and Ray was from the Sioux, Jack Fuller on drums. So that lineup after I left Coney Hatch, we went out and we played like Kirkland Lake and Sudbury and Capus Casing and places, honestly, and respectfully for residents in those towns, places that I never want to tour again, ever, right? <laughs> um, but but they had friends in Sault Ste. Marie and Jack Fuller, the drummer, his parents were in Sault Ste. Marie. So we were going to have a good time. It was like, well, this is going to be family. So we're playing a full week at the Eastgate, but there's one day off for some reason. And we're like, what the heck? Why did, like in the middle of the, it was a Thursday or something. And Probably a Wednesday. Our, I yeah. think it could be a Wednesday leading into your story because um, that's what happened. Okay. Yeah. So they said, and I remember my manager going, you're playing it full week, but you got Wednesday night off. And I was like, what the hell? That sound kind of, sounds kind of weird. So um, I was told that the reason they do that is because in Sioux, Michigan, across yeah. the river, yeah. it's just a big shit show party, a frat party over there. And all, all the people from this Canadian side go over there to party. So yeah. the young guys in the band convinced me, and they were probably, you know, five, six, seven years younger than me saying, come on, Kern, we're going to go across and we're going to drink all night we're going to party over on the sioux michigan side and i'm not a big drinker Ernest, but i said sure i'll join the reindeer game so over we go um certainly lost track of i, I don't know i want to say if there was there a place called the green door or something I just no just... no i was bringing i was going to bring it up it was called the back door the back door 
So I remember vaguely that being one of many places that we hit. And I got so shit faced that night that I do not remember coming across the border. The boys told me that they poured me into the van because I guess the guy, the guy at the, at the border, they just looked at me and they said, oh, he's asleep and, and went across. True story. Okay. I don't know how I got back into my hotel, how they got me in there. I woke up stark naked in the fetal position on a porcelain tiled floor in the bathroom of the east gate in my room shivering like shivering and, and just waking up and clearly i was talking to ralph on the porcelain telephone all night and just barfing my lungs out and that is my memory of my last time in sue playing a show and um, it took me a while to recover from that. And then we had to get on the stage the next night and, and rock it out for Thursday, Friday. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, no, I yeah. remember that story. It was great. They told me they just poured me in the room. They were yeah. just, they, they said they grabbed my key, opened it, pushed me in. So somehow I crawled. I somehow I got all my clothes off, but I remember just shivering and going, why am I so cold? And I just woke up and I was in the bathroom. To the, the Americans know how to do things because uh, the Wednesday would have been ladies night. And that's why everybody goes over there. They free pour like, you know what, if you're smart enough, you know, once she starts to pour, you, you get your buddy to say something to the bartender. She's like, oh, oh, yeah, it's just right over there. Hang your jacket up over there. And then. Right. Just you know, keep going. Three, yeah. You're just three yeah. quarters full of uh, nothing but uh, booze. But um, I do. Yeah. I do. I do like the Sioux. You know, if you said to me, Andy, you know, what are the towns that you did like up in northern Ontario? Certainly I had a great time in Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie. Kirkland Lake, Capus Casing, not so much, you know. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just it, that, that was the circuit back then. Yeah, well, Kirkland and um, Kirkland Lake, I mean, I think they got like 5,000 people. And no disrespect to the Kirkland Lake people, but it's way out of the way, right? So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Right the highway. So, um, before I let you go, um, the album's coming out on the 8th. Um, I was kind of thinking, it was kind of funny. I was at the grocery store and I was listening to the uh, album in my earbuds. I was thinking, this album's going to be the envy of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well and it, dude thank you for saying that and the name itself okay so let me tell you about envy of none and how we got the name um we uh i know it's a stock question you're probably like i'm not going to ask her where he got the name from but when we were writing together and this process just so uh, so you're clear and everybody that's listening probably started as far back as you know 2019 when I met when Maya and I started working so it's been a long ride and and we were talking about well what, what are we going to call this project because it really it's it's more a project less a band because there was no talk about are we a band are we going to tour what are we going to do are we going to shop a deal we just started writing these songs together and then it right. just it's a, a stupid overused phrase but it was very organic everything grew mm -hmm. organically so I remember Maya calling me and going Andy what are we going to call this project? I said, well, I don't know. It's hard to know when you're, I mean, you're out in the middle of nowhere. I said, I don't even know where you live. And she goes, oh, that's kind of cool. Let's call it middle of nowhere. So fast forward. Yeah. I'm talking to uh, um, Alex license lawyer, a guy by the name of David Quinton Steinberg and David played tracks uh, drums on five songs on the NBNN record. Oh, okay. He said, he said, have you, have you registered the name? Have you done a name search on it? Have you done a copyright? And I said, and, and I said, no. And he goes, Oh, well, I've got a computer here at work. I'm going to check it out for you. He goes, Oh yeah, the name's taken. There's like five bands called um, middle of nowhere. And I'm like, are you got to be kidding me? Are you serious? And we were doing up logos and everything. And he goes, well, don't worry about it. I got a name for you. I've been staying, you know, because he, he played, he had a punk band called The Mods. He was, he played with Stiv Baders and the Dev Boys. He's like, he's a musician. Yeah. And he goes, um, I've had this name around and, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to gift it to you. Envy of None. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Where did you get that from? He said when he was in law school, for some reason, one episode, uh, one class, they had to um, do some Greek mythology. And there's a, gr a Greek philosoph philosopher named Ovid, O-V-I-D. And he had this saying uh, and at the end of it, and you will be the envy of none, mm -hmm. which I kind of thought was funny. I was like, okay, this is kind of, not only can you not put a, a tag on it and go, this is a heavy metal band, or this is a folk band or something You're like any yeah. of none. What is that? But we 
And Alex Leipson has an amazing sense of humor. And he loved it because we were like, and, and we're going to be the envy of none. Look at us. We're, nobody's going to be envy of us, right? But maybe now, um, now that we've got this out, maybe there will be some people who go, man, I wish I was in that project. I don't know. I'm, I'm telling you, um, well, before I forget this little joke, uh, <laughs> I've never heard of a lawyer giving anybody anything for free. Yeah, I know, right? That's yeah. He's one of the good ones because he's a hybrid of a lawyer and and a musician. Okay, cool. Um, I gotta say, and to people that are watching, um, I mean, whether you grew up listening to Coney or or, or Rush or whatever, um, this is the type of music that you. you know, some of it is going to be the sound that I would think that, you know, if I ever get back to Cancun and I hit a nightclub again. You hear this bop, you know, it's in the background. It's kind of got a, a bit of a techno element to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and uh, if Alex was on the line with us, one of the things that he's very proud about is there's a lot of rhythmic components in this. Um, I love groove oriented stuff. People who know me really well, they're like, oh, yeah, Kern, I can hear it. That's you with the bass line, you know, and, and that that rhythm and that that the, the basement of a, of a song is there in this. But um we're i'm super proud of the record dude i had a yeah. lot of fun i had a lot of fun making it yeah. um and there was no respectfully there was no pressure of having a label breathing yeah. down our neck there was no manager there was it was just four people making music and having a great time doing it and so if it does well um that's fantastic if it doesn't i can tell you that the four of us had an amazing time making this record and, well, and i hope i hope people like it and um well, they're know, gonna I, like it i mean Quite often, I get uh, sent um, albums in advance of release, and I listen to them. Um, I don't know what percentage I'd have to say, but let's say I've got 50 in the last five years. I'll say about maybe 15 really caught my attention, and the other ones were good in their own elements. I've never would say that there's a bad one given to me. Uh, politically, it would be suicide. Right. <laughs> and then secondly, <laughs> it's just, yeah, I mean, it's just, that's art. It's art. If it wasn't yeah. for me, it's not for me. But this one, you know, is really caught my attention. Like I said, 30 seconds into um, um, Never Said I Love You, I was hooked. Wow. That's uh, are so you guys, cool. Are you guys, I know you guys uh, recently met physically. Um, was it in Toronto? She came yeah, we, yeah, Maya flew into Toronto and we sort of had a little celebration listening party. And then we did a, um, we did a big uh, Q&A with, um, you might know Alan Cross, who's a very, very... Yeah cool radio host so yeah. we did uh, we did some video q a with him uh we shot a video for with maya for look inside um and did some photos just you know kind of condensed everything into four days of work so that was great to see maya again because the only other time we saw her during the project was early on when we tracked drums for look inside and um i think it was shadow that she came in yeah. to sing but uh it was great for the four of us to be in the room together after all that time. And one one last thing that I want to tell you that we're proud of is mm. you you said art. Okay, so this yeah. this thing here, I forgot um, about that. Yes, yeah, it's, um, yeah, so, airline stewardess, correct? <laughs> I know. Well, it's it's like you kind of look at that and you go, "What is that? Who are they? What do they have there? What is going on here?" So, um, any any band or artist or musician they will tell you that that's a pretty that's a pretty tough process to go what's what's the album artwork going to look like and yeah. what are we going to do are we going to have band photos are we going to have this and that right so i can tell you that consistently and again Maya is so young that she would not know who Storm Thorgerson is or any anybody who knows hypnosis that did the covers for House, House of the Holy for Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, um, UFO Obsession. I mean, the list goes on and on and on about that British uh, company that did artwork for yeah. all all of those great like let's just talk about House of, House of the Holy right with yeah. the girls crawling up the rock. And we had a lot of conversation about this. So nowhere on that cover is there anything that says this is a heavy metal Led Zeppelin record. Yeah. Um, you look at it and it's eye candy and you walk into a store and you and I are music fans at heart. So there was lots of times I walked into a store or flipping through vinyl and went, oh, I love that cover. I'm going to buy it. I don't even know what it looks like. Right. Yeah. So it was important to us to have a cover 
an album artwork that didn't say anything, but maybe was evocative and got you thinking, right? Yeah. So I, I was down the rabbit hole one night and I don't know how or when or why I stumbled on this company, but they're called Plastic with a K at the end, P-L-A-S-T-I-K. Right. And it, turn, it turns out that there's a um, very talented photographer, graphic artist in, I believe, Lebanon is where he's from. And, and um, so I went on his Instagram, started looking at stuff, and it was loaded with imagery that I just fell in love with immediately. And I contacted him and said, is it possible we can license some, some artwork off you? I showed, the, I showed the website to Alex and Alf and Maya, and they went, oh my God, this company's amazing. Yeah. So that's where the artwork came from all the way from Lebanon. And we did, and, and uh, I love like anybody that's out in out there that loves visuals, check out this guy's company called plastic. They're amazing. Yeah. Marketing is huge. And that time the cover, like you said, it doesn't say anything specifically, but it gets you to keep looking and wondering. Yep. Yeah. And we did a little bit of Photoshopping because these, these ladies have these, these trays with these, and originally there was these high-end women's purses on there because he had, had done this photo this, uh, photo session and our guy at the label said, hey, well, what about if I just Photoshop them out and I'm thinking of putting something on them and he put these two giant pills yeah. and we were like, okay, sure, that's even weirder. That's deep. deep. <laughs> yeah. What are, what are they giving you? What are these yes. pills for? And lots of questions there and that's what we love. That's what we love about the name. That's what we love about the artwork. Perfect. Um, are you guys planning on any kind of um, live shows coming up in the future? It's been the number one question, Ernest. And, and I think, I think uh, again, if, if Mr. Lifeson was on with us, he, he's, he likes to say, we'll see. We'll see. Um, we never really spoke about touring it. Um, if, if the success of this thing it gets to a place where we're like, it's, we have to go out and play some shows, I have a feeling he would. He's not going to go out and play 60 shows or 40 no, shows. No. I know that. It would be, uh, there might be some one-offs. So, but he's like a, lo a lot of it, we got to be respectful to like the, the heat seeking missile in this project is uh, the iconic rock and roll hall of fame guitarist, Alex likes him. So if Al thinks he wants to do a half dozen shows i'm sure we would do it if al doesn't want to do any shows then we won't do any shows right. he is he is the the zen master in this one right yeah yeah and you, and, and you know it's kind of interesting on how life uh, works uh, andy um you brought up three times now because i'm counting <laughs> if alex were on with us and i'm trying to get an interview with alex but chip i have to say is the best and i and I couldn't have got uh, to speak with you today without Chip. Uh, he's quite he's quite the uh, promoter, and he's he's done a great job with you guys. And uh, thank you, Chip. By the way, yeah, thanks, Chipster. He's great, and um, you know what they. Do. They're working, uh, Alex, like a rented mule. He's been doing all kinds of press um, in Europe right now. So they wanted to, they wanted yeah. to, you know, at one point he called me up and he said, Andy, I got 34 interviews. And I said, oh. buddy, I said, buddy, I'll help you. Okay. Like bring me out of the dugout if you need. And I, and I get it, Ernest, you know, like a lot yeah. of people would prefer to speak to Alex. He's much more iconic. Everybody knows him, but the poor guy, he's one quarter of the project. He's like, People should talk to you, Andy. They should talk to Maya. They should talk to yeah. Alfie. This is, you know, so uh, I'm sure if if it was discussed with Chip, there was no um, disrespect other than they're working him like a rented. No, I, your, I understand right that. And, and that's yeah. something I've learned over the years, too, as well as I've talked that. Uh, just a little bit of a segue here. We're always saying, oh, the band should get back together like Van Halen. Like, you know what? We put you in those mansions by buying your records but we have to understand as say writers or just fans that you guys are just as normal as we are you have lives you get tired if you have a job where you work with people that you're not quite getting along with and you move on to another job well you don't go back because the other co-workers say hey we want you back because you're funny in the lunch right right so no. very very true and funny story that I'll leave you with about Alex that I don't think he would mind tell me telling. Perfect. I was I was over at his house about a month ago, and there and I think his wife had heard through, you know, heard conversations and telephone calls, and she walked up to me and she said, "Andy Kern, don't you dare try to get my husband back out on the road. I just got him back." 
Yeah. So, so you think about that as a Rush fan and you go, wait a sec. Okay, Alex, had, like you just said, he's spent all these 40 plus years on the road and finally he's winding it down and he's a family guy and he's got grandkids and he's got yeah. a wife. And so let, like, let the guy live, let him have, let him have his, his time. He's earned it. If anybody's earned the right to say, I'm not going on the road anymore, that boy has. <laughs> and so right? is Andy Curran, man. You're very yeah. humble. One Thank more you. thing before I let you go, which yeah, is great, because before we got on video here, um, your screenshot is a logo of the Blackhawks. And we talked yes. previously, you're a hockey fan. Do you, do you want to see that for everybody? One sec. Sure. Where is it? There you there go. There we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> when awesome. I had a little bit more hair, I was standing outside the Hawks dressing room in Chicago. There you go. Yeah. Um, have you ever been on tour with Firehouse and Bill Leverty? No. No. Okay. He, so, uh, okay. Continue. No. Um, do, do you know, uh, have you met Bill before? Or? No, no. Give me the background on that. Well, I, I interviewed him about a month ago and I asked him about, you know, his favorite Canadian musician and stuff like that. And what do you have to say to your Canadian fans? And he, af he left off the interview by saying, thank you, Canada, for giving the United States hockey. And he went on to say that he grew up in Virginia. Okay. And he actually played hockey and he was... He insinuated that, that he was, you know, going pretty far because he said he had a shoulder injury and surgery and he went, he knows everything about hockey and he still plays pickup men's league, but he went on and on about Bush league hockey and stuff. And he says, it's the toughest sport. It's the most talented sport. And he says, no disrespect to the other ones, but you've got the boards. They don't give after three feet up. They don't give after that. They give just a bit. He goes, when yep. you fall, you fall on ice. Ice yeah. isn't soft. It's not like <laughs> turf. So I was just wondering if you and uh, Bill uh, had ever crossed paths, and the next time you do, maybe you guys could pick up. We we could have some good stories. Well, listen, I, I if you're okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about hockey and yeah. love of hockey as we finish. So um, I, you have I, to you have to say this is uh, they're going to win the uh, OHL championship. Okay, but I don't see the logo. Who is that? Sue? Is that the Sue Graham? Well, um, I'm from the Sioux, so I would say okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. The, the Sioux Greyhounds are going to win the, the, their division and maybe go all the way. Oh, um, perfect. Coming from Andy yeah. Curran, that's probably it's probably going to happen. There you go. And I, if I correct me if I'm wrong, is Tony Esposito not an ex co uh, Sioux Greyhound? Was he um, uh, back Tony, in the day? Phil and Tony were both born in the Sioux. Yeah. I don't know if um, Tony actually played for the Hounds, but I know he played for the Hawks, but uh, but. No, Phil and Tony uh, were born, both uh, born and uh, raised in Sault Ste. Marie, yes. Well, God God bless his soul, and, and, and we'd need a whole other episode to tell you how I became friends with Tony Esposito, but my love yeah. of a hockey, I was five years old, and, I, and, and my dad knew I was obsessed, and he... Uh, I've got three brothers and he put us all into skating, power skating. And then next thing you know, we were playing hockey. And so from the age of five, much like a lot of Canadian boys um, and, and the equivalent to, to Americans, baseball and Americans and hockey and Canadians, it's in my DNA. Yeah. Um, I, I've told this to many people, Ernest, if I, if I had my choice back then, I was like, I'm going to make, I'm going to be in the NHL. I'm going to go to the show. That's what I want to be. I want to be a national hockey league player. I want to go to it all the way. So as I was growing up, um, I started to get better. I got to the level where I was playing triple A hockey, which is a pretty good level. Yep. And then, and then um, continued on in high school where I played for the junior and senior hockey team. It was at that point that not only did I get a bass guitar, but I discovered that the, the boys were much bigger and faster than I was. And I was getting crushed. I'm 150 pounds wet out of the shower. I was getting <laughs> like hammered all over the place. And so I realized that I was not going to the NHL. <laughs> so uh, enter rock and roll. The entire time though, that period in Coney from 82 to 85, um, I didn't skate a lot. Uh, we were on the road like solid. But when I got back home, bought new gear and fast forward to today i'm skating three times a week um i still love it i play i don't play beer league it's more like men's shinny pickup hockey yeah. and my favorite part is going out for beers and wings afterwards but um it's it's an amazing escape i love chasing around a stupid little puck for an hour to two hours and just forget about everything it uh, helps me keep my panther like figure to try to stay thin if ever i gotta get back out on the road but yeah. 
the, it's earnest. Like it's not a love dude. It's an obsession. I have the NHL network. I watch every single Chicago Blackhawks game. I've got all of their, their, their blogs online. I know exactly what's who's playing every game. I know who's, who's getting traded the rumor mills and, um, and I, I love it. It's, it's just, it's just a, a guilty pleasure of mine. I'm, I'm a, obsessed with hockey in the Chicago Blackhawks. Well, I, you mean, I would, uh, I would digress and say that you could have made it because you look Denny Savard. <laughs> yep. He's a little guy and to it's a little guy, but yeah. I don't never had the hands that those guys had. And, and you know what, to be honest with you, um, Andy Curran, that sounds like a hockey player. <laughs> well, let's get a, let's get. I should at least get a hockey card made up with me, you know, with the with the stick and everything, right? Yeah. But uh, no, those like the, the hockey, rock and roll, cars, women. What else is there, buddy? Dogs, right? Yeah, Wine, yeah. Hamburgers. We could go down <laughs> the list. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I'd like to thank you, Andy. Um, oh, did I ask you earlier? If not, what's the opposite of unsubscribe? subscribe do as andy says and subscribe to the channel i'm trying to get thank you very much and the 200th subscriber is going to get an autographed brian adams coffee mug uh the thing is i'm just going to have to talk to brian and ask him about that too so <laughs> uh, we'll see what that happens but uh in any event i had a great chat with you andy man it was, it was awesome as always and uh yeah this album's going to go through the roof i'm going to leave under the description box links to um the uh website and everything and uh if we don't see you on tour we'll uh we'll see you on virtual absolutely Ernest. thanks for the time buddy it's always good chatting with you it feels like uh two old boys chewing the fat and just talking about stuff but um uh you're a good man great questions today and and um thank you for spreading the word on envy and none buddy thanks and i like the good man thing i'm a better man than my mother i like that <laughs> Take I like that. Okay, buddy. See you, Ernest. Cheers, pal. Bye. Bye. Bye.